yeah, we're we're really digging your information, and you've kind of yes. turned us on to like this this idea that uh, I could be a big part of this whole thing, and we don't necessarily have to rely on midwife. You know, I I have three sisters and myself, and we were all born in our home, this home mm -hmm. we're in right now. And my dad delivered me and one of my sisters. And with my sister, the midwife ran up the stairs as she was halfway out of my mom. So, <laughs> you know, that I think encourages me to, 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 to know that, hey, maybe we, do, like, maybe we don't even need anybody here. Maybe it can just be me and you and we can just, and our son, and maybe we can just do it together, you know? And, and so I think the direction that we're leaning towards is doing the undisturbed birth but i think there in the back of our mind there's always that fear that hey what if something happens but if something happens and you have to go to the hospital and a midwife's here what is the midwife going to do the same thing yeah. that we could probably do ourselves and you make a really good point on just really like educating yourself on you know what could go wrong and you know arm yourself with what you can do to help it um, yeah with you know doing this at home and the husband kind of handling all of it I'm, I'm speaking for I think a lot of the husbands out there <laughs> who might be on the fence over 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 doing a birth like this you know what kind of things could go wrong you know because I think that as a husband that's what you fear most is you think when you're in an environment where you have like a midwife or a ho you know in a hospital, you've got people there to, to, to provide medical treatment for your wife if something were to happen. What sort of things do you foresee happening, like worst case situations, and how would these husbands handle these situations? Well, I think there's two big fears, right, for everyone involved mom dying and baby dying and so um the the biggest what i know to be one of the biggest causes for maternal death is hemorrhage however hemorrhage comes from pushing too long too hard um and you're not supposed to push like that right you know pushing really is like you can see the baby's head not every woman has to push because there's the fetal ejection reflex and and some women don't experience the fetal ejection reflex so if you have an injury to your nervous system maybe you won't maybe you, you know or your nerves could just be desensitized for any number of reasons and so maybe you won't feel it um so do try to you know if you don't feel if you're not feeling this natural urge to push like when you have a bm then yeah try to give a little push but don't push until you're blue purple in the face it's okay for the baby to rock back and forth through the pelvis and I think a lot of us don't understand that the reason why the cranial bones in the head are not fused together and the reason why the baby comes out in a cone shape is so their heads can become smaller for the birth canal they they literally go over each other they slide over each other um, so it's okay for the babies to rock back and forth through the pelvis and they're actually already in the yoni. Um, you know, the, the baby's head really, the yoni has been dilating over the baby's head the entire time. Really everything has been pulled up by the contractions in the uterus and then the uterus at the end there is pushing the baby down. So it's already right there. And so it, again, it is okay to take time to allow that perineum to open and slide up over the baby's head. So the more effort that you're applying over a long period of time, say, you know, like hours, <coughs> you run the risk of um, a hemorrhage and bleeding. And so if you do bleed, you want to apply pressure and compression to the uterus and that's just like it sounds find the uterus clamp down on it actually physically put your hands down on the uterus and clamp down 
call 911. Call, you know, and you can always, you can, there's nothing that says you can't, you can hire a midwife and you can either choose to tell her the truth or lie to her because it depends on her liability and what her willingness to do. So I really encourage everyone to be open and honest in the beginning there and say, listen, we're having a home birth. I'm looking more into a free birth, kind of undisturbed birth scenario where, you know, maybe I want you to show up, but maybe I kind of don't. Um, I'm really feeling that humanity needs to learn how to birth and I'd rather be educated about how to have birth and how to have a safe birth. And what are your fears as a midwife? What have you seen for people like me? Um, how can you educate me to kind of be my own caregiver? And then in, in a perfect world, I would tell her, like, I'll call you when I need you. And if I need you, I'll, you know, like if something's going on, I'm going to call you. But I'd rather you maybe just go in the other room, you know, or just go back to your house and that's what I paid you $4,000 for is to be on call for me. Um, so, you know, if something's going down, that's the time to call 911, right? Like if it's like really emergent and both of you can agree on that. Um, that is like the biggest thing with mothers. Um, and then with the baby, it, same thing, right? The baby passing away. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, and one other reason that you can bleed um, and hemorrhage out is switching over from oxytocin to adrenaline based, you know, all of a sudden you're like, it happens a lot in the hospital where you're like traumatized. Um, you undergo like a really traumatic birth and then on top of like the really long strenuous labor, being unhealthy then all of a sudden you have this surge of adrenaline that wasn't supposed to be in birth and it thins out your blood and then you start bleeding. Oh, yeah. right? It takes you away from those contractions, those oxytocin contractions. Um, and then you had, said, you had said in one of your videos that we were listening to about how um, something that could cause hemorrhaging is um, during that that birthing process uh possibly pushing too soon is mm -hmm. that right or someone being in your bubble you know that you might not not want there those are is that right those are some other reasons right. that that could occur. right if you don't want someone there you're switching out of that calm transformative uh, metaphysical birth to like concentrating on I don't want you here and that's adrenaline right you're switching right. over you're it's it's really interesting when you look at the anatomy of the pituitary gland it looks like a little it looks like little testicles it looks like a little ball sack and it's divided in two compartments and the posterior pituitary gland makes it makes two hormones it makes its own hormones and then in the anterior pituitary gland i think there's like seven hormones it's been a while but it is actually storing those hormones it's not making them and it's coming from uh the hypothalamus so the posterior pituitary gland is making oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone antidiuretic hormone to keep water in your body and oxytocin, that love hormone that is so famous for being present in birth, you know? So it's such an important hormone. And then you have the adrenaline component, medical medium information, those 56 different blends of adrenaline. And you're switching out of, or maybe not switching out of it completely, but then you're turning on another adrenal blend that isn't supposed to be in birth. And it's you know, it's that stress blend. It's that really corrosive blend that he's always talking about and saying like, hey, we're doing this too much. And I think it also probably happens to women who, you know, they're drinking coffee or they're not, you know, maybe they're living really stressful lives. You know, they're really worried about the baby. They're not really secure in birth. And I mean, there's, and there's a metaphysical component to it as well. They're, um, one of the midwives, when we went through the cohort together, um, 
she was a nurse in the hospital for 10 years. Um, and she said that there was a hemorrhage room, that every woman that went into that particular room in the hospital had a hemorrhage. It didn't matter. It was vibrationally imprinted into that room. You know, yeah. like metaphysical energy exists. So if you have a midwife, if you have a caregiver that carries that vibrational energy with them, they could be bringing that into your birth. You know, if they doubt you, if you doubt yeah. yourself, it well, fear well, is even, fear brings a lot. Even, you know, yeah. just going through the hospital process when we were put into the hospital looking back at it it's such a stressful thing especially if you're living this medical medium lifestyle and you know what these what goes on now all of a sudden they're taking blood from you they want to put you your baby on a, a doppler to know what's going on with the heartbeat and know, know what's going on with the baby and then you've got four doctors in there and they want to test you for covid and you know it's like you've got all these people disturbing your whole birth process people coming in and out of the room all the time to check on you. it's like that's just a really disturbing way to have a child you know you're yeah. You're, yeah. you're not in a comfortable place it's so another like really important aspect for the father to acknowledge your you have complete legal authority over the birth. So if there are too many people in the room, it's your legal right to say, I don't want the nurse here anymore. You could fire your doctor. You could tell everyone to get out. You're paying it. You know, it's it's your birth. And so many dads don't understand that it's their legal, lawful, spiritual, familial right to advocate for his partner and baby. It doesn't matter matter if you're married or not because you're the one taking them home. You're the one paying for this baby's school, you know? And so if that nurse is bothering you, tell, ask her to leave. You don't have to be ugly about it. You can say, excuse me, ma'am, could you, could you please leave? We need a few moments. You really, and then you can also just stand up too and just say, everyone needs to leave. There's too many people in here. <laughs> You know, if you've got all these residents in here and, you know, things are getting chaotic and you see that the situation, it, it shouldn't be up to your doula, you know, to your doula is there really to support you and to help remind you that you're in charge. And then she sure. can go get some food or water and come back, you know, and then stay with your wife while you go with the baby, you know, and help make sure that your wife is okay. Sure. But it's the doula is not the one who makes the decision. A lot of people are wanting to hire doulas or, again, these midwives thinking like, okay, this would be a good person to have in charge. No, you're in charge, you know, and both of you are in charge. And, and when the woman is in the throes of labor, though, she's going to another place. And the hospital staff recognizes enough to say that you're incompetent and and you can't make a decision because you're hysterical. You're talking from your hysterical place, your uterus, right? Hysterectomy is Latin, you know, for the uterus, like hystera. It, it's our hysterical place. The word play there. Right. And so yeah. that's a lot of times why we, you know, you're, you're crazy. You don't have those symptoms, you know, like it, you're just making it up in your head. I mean, so many women probably hear that more than men, you know, but that's, it's meant to, to bring us down, to put us down, you know? Um, so just always remember you're in charge no matter where you go. Yeah. There, I mean, clinical birth, is being orchestrated by darkness to separate us from our spiritual connection. And that is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about undisturbed birth. And especially for our medical medium community. We've worked so hard to reestablish this connection, yeah. you know, and, and rise out of the ashes. And then so many, I know so many women are still being subjected to too much clinical management and they're being disconnected again and I'm, and again it's like there's a time and a place and you can have 
you know, a spiritual connection with this, you know, clinical experience. But it needs to be, um, there needs to be informed consent. You know, mother has to say, like, this is okay. Dad's got to be okay. And, it, you know, none of this fear-mongering and, you know, it just, it happens. And it's really sad. Yeah, I will say, if, if you do have to do a transfer, if the baby is mostly stable, just wait, you know, give yourself that hour. That's my biggest piece of advice is make sure you get a good breastfeeding in. Um, cause there just are scenarios where, um, cause very much Wapio really talked about this to us. Um, she was like, you know, if you need to do a transfer, but you can stay home for that hour, make sure you do it. Um, and then of course everybody goes together and then, you know, maybe get a support person to go with you and then realize that you and baby are going to be separated for a long time. So, you know, maybe even try to get a pump in, um, you know, like, so you do the one breastfeeding, try to collect, um, some of that colostrum and stuff. So when you do go to the hospital, dad can follow baby if he can, and then make sure that that, that next feeding is, is available for the baby because they're going to want to do, they're going to treat you like strangers and they're going to do all this testing. They're going to do every single test because you haven't been in their system and they're going to override you in a sense, you know, they're going to override both of you because you're coming in on a transfer. Um, and it's enough to override both of you and say that, well, we have to do this. Um, yeah. look what, and then, look what you caused. We, you know, you're in here now, you didn't do it right. So let us do our job and do it right. Right. And, and always really just, you don't just tell them it happened really fast whatever, you know, and, you know, like you, maybe you were planning something else. Like you, you don't have to tell them everything, um, you know, because then they just, they can be more critical of you and it changes their, you know, it changes their care and how compassionate they are towards you. Um, so yeah, that golden hour is really important. Um, And I will say, like, there's this really, like, there's this interesting story. Like, just to, like, like, Wabio told us a couple of stories of, like, babies dying at home. Um, and, like, fathers having to, um, you know, they still have that golden hour with the baby before they ever call the ambulance. You know, like, there is still, like, because, you know, things do happen. And so, and really, if, and this is not for you guys, this is for anybody, you know, this is like, it's for your children, for the next generation of sick people, for your neighbor, like whatever, you know, this is just informational purposes, but you don't have to call the ambulance, you call the coroner, or you research in your state, who would you call if there was something like that? And if the baby's not born alive, you just call, you would just call a coroner and then they come and examine the body and then they classify what caused the death. Um, and then honestly, actually, I want to even further say that if it's, if you, if you own the property and the baby is not born alive, I think you can just bury your baby and you don't have to call anyone. Um, but if your baby is born alive, then that's like a different thing. It's very particular um, how to handle those things. But I really do feel that the men should be educated on all these things and be able to help, and the, and the wife, you know, and the woman. And I think that you guys could be the ones doing the cervical checks. You know, I think that would be better than the midwife. Yeah. Why couldn't you do a cervical check and learn what it feels like? Your fingers are up there anyway, <laughs> usually during <laughs> intimacy or have been up there and it would right. be more comfortable for the woman anyway. So I don't know. There changes on the horizon.